Good evening. Uh, my name is Ross Jordan. I'm the curatorial manager at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum. Jane Addams Hull House Museum is located on the campus of the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we draw upon the legacy of international peace activists, suffragists, and feminist Jane Addams, and other social reformers that lived and worked alongside their immigrant neighbors to expand democracy on the near west side of Chicago. The museum connects the progressive era and whole house settlement history to present day social justice issues. Tonight's discussion and film screening of Surge is part of the museum's continued public program series that commemorates the 100th anniversary of, of the passage of the 19th Amendment. This program also supports the museum's current exhibitions, Why Women Should Vote, titled after a 1910 essay by Jane Addams that traces the women's voter education in Illinois and highlights Ida B. Wells in the history of racism within the suffrage movement. The second exhibition, True Peace, The Presence of Justice, titled after a phrase attributed to Jane Addams, juxtaposes the international peace and human rights activism led by women in opposition to World War I with present day social justice issues around policing, prisons, campaigns that are often led by women and queer people of color. You can visit both exhibitions virtually on our website at wholehousemuseum.org. Many of you are joining us from community libraries across Illinois, whose partnerships during a pandemic have made the virtual program and or virtual exhibitions accessible to the public. We welcome and thank our library partners reaching across Illinois library systems, or Public Library, Gil Borden Public Library, Arlington Heights Memorial Library, and Schomburg Township Library. We also thank our museum partners that are making tonight possible, the Sable Museum of African American History and the Chicago History Museum. Tonight's discussion features Congresswoman Lauren Underwood of Illinois' 14th District, filmmakers Hannah Rosenwig and Wendy Sash, and American Library Association Executive Director, Tracy Hall. We are thrilled to be joined by all of them. After the discussion, we will provide a link to watch the film that will be available until 11 p.m. Central, 12 p.m. Midnight Eastern. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, be sure to click the Eventbrite link in the comment section to register, for, to, register to receive a link to the film. You can also stream the film anytime on Showtime or BET. In 1910, Jane Addams wrote an essay, Why Women Should Vote, as an effort to convince women, particularly immigrant women, that they should advocate for themselves to win the franchise. Tonight, we're discussing why women should run and how women's leadership shapes our democracy. Now I'm gonna invite our, uh, our first speakers to um, the table. We're gonna be with Tracy Hall and Congresswoman Underwood. Tracy Hall is the 10th executive director of the American Library Association in its 153 year history. In her role, Hall oversees the oldest and largest library association in the world. Hall is the first African-American executive director in ALA's history. Tracy Hall is joining us tonight because she is a champion of institutions that inspire Americans to inquire, learn, and participate in our democracy as informed citizens. Congresswoman Underwood serves Illinois' 14th district and was sworn in into the 116th U.S. Congress on January, 19, January 3rd, 2019. Congresswoman Underwood is the first woman, the first person of color, and the first millennial to present, represent her community in Congress. She's also the youngest African-American woman to serve in the United States House of Representatives. She resides in Naperville, Illinois. Welcome Tracy Hall and Lauren Underwood. Thank you. Tracy, you're muted. I'm super excited. I'm just, I'm just over here being excited and, and thinking about so much, so many questions for you. Um, 
the first thing that I think comes up for me when I think about you, Lauren, is legacy and how brilliant, how brilliant the road is before you and how stony the road behind you has been. So I just want to right away, I just want to, we're in this year where we have a, a lot of firsts, but when I think about you, I'm thinking about Shirley Chisholm, for sure. I'm thinking about um, the first real viable run and, and how you, when you were e elected, you became the, the youngest um, Black woman to serve in Congress. So before I ask you all of the questions that I have about you, about Surge, I want to talk about influence. And I want to ask you about people like Shirley Chisholm and others who, who inspired you or who you call upon um, day to day. Yes. Well, Tracy, what a treat it is to be in conversation with you. I'm so grateful uh, to these libraries and institutions and these museums who sponsored uh, the event this evening. Thank you for having me and thank you for investing in search. Um, so listen, when I decided to run, you know, I wasn't thinking that we were going to make history and that this was going to turn into all that it has become, right? It was really just trying to solve this problem of protecting our health care in this country. Um, but I think that it was possible because I grew up in an environment that said, you know, I really could be anything. And of course, I could represent my community. Um, I was a young girl when the two most powerful Black women were on television every day. One was Senator Carol Mosley Braun, who represented Illinois in the United States Senate as the first and at that time the only uh, Black woman who had been elected to the Senate. We have the second Black woman serving in the Senate and Senator Kamala Harris right now, right? So as, as to put this into context, right, this is a relatively new phenomenon to have this type of representation. Yeah. So. I would see Senator Mosley Braun on television every night and I knew she was mine and she was like me and I was just so proud because she was powerful, which was powerful. And then Oprah Winfrey was on television twice a day here in Chicago <laughs> and she was the most powerful black woman and I felt like she was mine. She was less than an hour away every day. And so, you know, as a young girl, I felt like you know, I could be whatever I wanted to be. And at that time I wanted, you know, to be a pediatric cardiologist and cause I have a heart condition and I would go and see them. And I didn't know I was gonna end up doing this. Um, but I think that having role models and people to inspire you are so important. And then when I was running and got elected and I walked into the halls of Congress and yes, it's a little isolating. And it was made clear to me that that place was not built for someone like me. Right, the United States Congress in its origins was for wealthy white male landowners. Right, and here I am as a young black woman, um, and you know I was so inspired by Shirley Chisholm because she was not only the first, but she was the only for a long time in this place by herself. I'm lucky to have so many. There's about 25 of us black women in Congress. Um, and to be able to draw strength from and, and work with in partnership and collaboration, but she was the only one. And so, you know, that is something else entirely. So when you talk about inspiration, you know, I'm grateful that my journey occurred at a time when I could learn from these icons um, because I draw strength from them every day. So oh, this is why I'm so grateful to Ross Jordan and to Dane Adams Hull House because talking to you about women and millennials and people of color running in um, unprecedented numbers is so timely. And I want to ask you about that journey for you and, and in the hopes that can inspire others who are listening. Um, so I want to start with the fact that and you've talked about this a little bit, licensed at it as a nurse, you've dedicated your career to trying to expand healthcare across America. At what point, Lauren, did it occur to you that you could best do that by running for office? Oh, um, I would say 
it wasn't something that I had planned on. You know, I began my career um, in policy at the Department of Health and Human Services. And at that time, the Affordable Care Act had just gotten signed into law, and we had this huge task ahead of us of trying to implement health reform on this crazy timeline. And I thought that the Secretary of Health and Human Services was like the position to be able to make this change. And over the course of the four and a half years I was at the department, I started to see that, you know, there was an opportunity to make change, but that might not be it. Um, and, you know, I didn't know what position would allow me to have the impact that I would want to have. Certainly looking at the whole country and the change that we need to see as a country. But what I can tell you is that I decided to run after going to a town hall hearing a promise from my congressman about protecting health care coverage for people like me with pre-existing conditions um, during a time of Obamacare repeal where this was, you know, the issue um, that the country was trying to work through and then to witness him break his word. That's when I felt convicted that we deserved better. Now, I didn't necessarily know that um, that the Congress was gonna be the place for me to have the impact that I would wanna have on our healthcare system. I just knew that we couldn't be cavalier with our healthcare and something that was so important to the well being of the American people. And, we, and you can't lie. And so that's really how this came about. That was the genesis for me. It was not, um, you know, sitting down with my master life plan and, you know, <laughs> charting out this path. That wasn't, that wasn't how it happened for me. Right. Third on your to-do list. Let me run for Congress. Right. So I want to, I really want to get into it because we have a lot of young people who, we have a lot of people, period, regardless of age, who honestly are disenchanted. They're disenchanted with our political system. They, they don't think that voting changes things. They don't think um, that there is really the opportunity to see real traction on the things that they care about within our political system. You are right now, you are, you're in the midst of it. What are the opportunities for real change and how are you, especially this year, trying to connect with people who are disaffected, who, who feel left out, and how should we? How should we connect with people who feel that they, they don't have the power and, and change is, is actually a promise, but not a reality? Yes. So, you know, it's been so interesting because we use these phrases, particularly among women in politics, this phrase, representation matters, and how much... Um, the way the way that we legislate and what we choose to prioritize is influenced by who holds the seats, who sits at the table. We are the ones that set the agenda. And you know, I think that for people who are in politics, it's almost like this, it's been normalized so much that we're like, yes, of course. But I think that the public has sort of um, unfortunately missed out on this conversation so much. And so the clearest example that I have is the formation of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, right? I am a 33-year-old Black woman, um, and my entire lifetime, this country has had a disparity in maternal mortality. Black women are three to four times more likely to die as a result of childbirth or pregnancy-related complications than white women. And this is a disparity that's existed my whole lifetime. We have never had a national initiative, Surgeon General support, or any kind of national um, legislation to kind of fix this problem explicitly. And so when I won, I knew that this was something that I wanted to work on. I got to Congress, found a partner and Congresswoman Alma Adams from North Carolina. We started a caucus, gave ourselves a name. The reason I'm telling the story is literally within six months of founding, we had a hundred members. It's bipartisan. We passed the first Medicaid expansion since the Affordable Care Act. Um, so 10 years to ex expand coverage from 60 days to a full year postpartum, which is the best thing that you can do to save mom's lives in this country. And it happens because we are here. We are holding the seats and we are doing the work on behalf of folks who just hadn't had a voice, um, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't had champions in Congress. If people think that their voices don't matter, then I think that they are missing um, 
uh, the, they're missing a glimpse in, in how powerful they are. So, you know, I spend a lot of time engaging with my constituents. We've done dozens of town halls. We've done 135 public events. And over the course of these two years, I hear themes over and over and over and over again. And that's what dictates the work that I do. But for people who choose to opt out, maybe they don't vote, maybe they don't engage their policymakers, maybe they're not, um, you know, on the email list or going to events or whatever, then I could see how they feel like people aren't being responsive. But at the end of the day, the representatives probably have no clue what's important to them because there's not that kind of dialogue and exchange. I would just invite people who are feeling let down, frustrated, and like their voice doesn't matter to reach out to whoever represents them, or they can reach out to my office too. Like, please don't sit there and think that America has left you behind. Don't think that, you know, you, there's no place for you in our political dialogue because we need everybody's perspective. If we are truly gonna have this more perfect union that we seek in this country, we cannot have folks um, feel like they're just always left out. Um, and especially during this election, when we know that if every young person voted, right, if every woman voted, if every person of color voted, we would have, um, and we would bring change to this country. Um, and I think that change is what a lot of people are seeking right now. Yeah, so I want to stay on that because I was, my brother and I were texting this this morning and we were talking about the events of this week alone. We know that 2020 is dragging us, right? Oh, but big time. <laughs> big time. But just uh, this past week alone, it has, you know, there's been, there's been so much. And uh, the, the, you know, sometimes it's, it's many important things can get lost because there's so much going on. I know that one of the things that brought me to the position that I occupy now um, leading the American Library Association is um, my belief, especially when we talk about public health and in, in, in libraries, we, we call it public health informatics. How do people get the information that they need to keep themselves healthy? And one of the things that brings me to this position is the fight for universal broadband. I believe that free open internet is attendant to the right to read and I, I fight for that every day. I wanna, I wanna, I know that you are a champion for healthcare and, and healthcare access. And I love that. I love that about your work because that thread is crystal clear in all that you do. But what are just some of the other issues that we should be paying attention to that you wanna make sure are not lost in this election? Yes. So, you know, let's stay on this broadband piece. So we talk a lot about, and this is like a nonpartisan talking point about rebuilding America, right? infrastructure, and it's not just roads, bridges, right? We're talking about things like broadband because without it, right, during COVID, our students are struggling to stay on track with their assignments, whether they're in-person, virtual, or hybrid, right? You need to have access to this information exchange. Um, and it is critical, these linkages during the pandemic. It's critical for healthcare. It's critical for growing our economy. We're in a recession. And our economy is struggling. And if we, if we are gonna be able to return to the quarter after quarter of growth, then we need to have every corner of this country connected with the opportunity to participate in this global economy. And that just can't happen if we do not have the physical infrastructure and we don't have the internet access. And it impacts my district. It's something that we've been working on over these last two years. And so that's something that is literally on the ballot. Um, when I think about climate change yeah. on the ballot this year, right? Um, and we know that there's been, you know, dramatic attention that's been paid, but it, fueled by young people, right? You think of folks like Greta and all of the climate activists around the country. I mean, this is a youth-led movement. Um, gun violence prevention is another one. Um, and, so, and that has a real Chicago connection. And, you know, I think that the change that we want to see in the city and in our state and in our country is one where we cannot be passive, right? We cannot assume that someone else is going to fight for, on our behalf to bring the change to our communities. I mean, it's literally, I mean, it might as well just be a little check mark that you bubble in <laughs> on the ballot. It is, it is that clear to me. Um, and so, you know, in Illinois, 
I think that a lot of folks are familiar with this idea of corruption and you know the need to make sure that elected officials are truly serving and representing their communities. None of this abuse of power, none of this, you know, getting rich, none of, you know, all of this like gross, grimy stuff that happens. And so, you know, we talk about cleaning up corruption and that's on the ballot, right? Like that is a major priority, certainly of mine, but I think that, you know, thematically across the country. And so I think that there's kind of a, no matter what partisan or political ideologies that you may have, there's a lot kind of at stake in this season. And that's, there's a lot that brings people out uh, when they think about casting their votes. So Lauren, I wanna ask you one more question before I call on Ross and, and he brings in our filmmakers uh, for questions uh, that I have for the three of you, so many. But I wanna ask you, I think my closing question is that you say something in the trailer just surge um, that really stayed with me. You, you talk about the fact that uh, when in running and in being elected, you are pulling a seat up to a table that no one invited you to. That stayed with me. And I wanna, I wanna talk about that for a minute. Now you do have a seat at the table. And what are you, what would you tell others who might say, I really care about a very specific issues. I think I want to dedicate my life and my career to them, but this is hard work. Hard. And I don't know if I, if I, if I'm cut out for this, what would you tell them? Well, I would say girlfriends, we need you to run. And so the, the data tells us a few things. One, that women have to be asked to run for office. Hmm. Um, sometimes men will look in the mirror and they'll say, I look like a senator. <laughs> I'm going to be president one day, right? Women, we don't do that. Um, and so we need to be asked. So this is me asking you. And then this is me saying, we will support you. There is a whole community of people that can train you and educate you on how to run for office, like the literal mechanics. Um, and then there's these communities, which I didn't even realize that my community was so excited about this idea of a young person and a woman stepping forward to run. Um, sometimes we think that it's jumping off the cliff without a parachute, but the parachute, you don't even need it. <laughs> because Lauren, you by your community, do you mean Naperville? No, I, I mean Naperville, but I also mean our state and our country, right? Like there is, um, it is not a fad, but that there among, I, I guess, just like our core values is that we want representative democracy in this country, right? Our, our founding documents, um, set it up structurally, but then forever, we've just been electing a certain kind of person. Well, you know, that habit is being disrupted right now. And so when I say our community, I mean, the American people are interested in electing real people with diverse backgrounds and experiences and ideas and a commitment to service. And so you know, you don't have to feel like you're jumping off a cliff and you're gonna hurt yourself because what I'm here to tell you is that you have what it takes already. You are more than enough just as you are. And so you just need to be willing to take the leap and you're gonna find out that you can fly, you can soar and you will win. That's what I've learned in my time on this journey. And when I say you will win, it's as you'll see in the film, it's not just about winning an election, right? It's about making change and inspiring people and informing a debate and making a difference. That's what winning means to me. Um, and that's what I think the beauty of Surge is, is that through the three of us, myself, Liz Watson and Janelyn Sanchez, you really get to see um, not only how we ran for office in our campaigns and the struggles and the triumphs, but also, right, the throughput on like, making the change in our country that we all know that we need to see in terms of representation, women's leadership, um, and, you know, just doing the work. Wow. Lauren, you are so real and inspirational. I hope, I hope everyone gets an opportunity to see the film, but also to hear you. Um, I, well, <coughs> Ross, I'm going to ask you to come back in, and here you are, and introduce our filmmakers. Um, thank you both. Okay, so now we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by two of the filmmakers of the film that we're going to see this evening. 
um, about Lauren's campaign in part and also two other campaigns um, where women were running for office. Um, so I'm gonna invite Hannah Rosewig and Wendy Sash to our video call here. Um, Hannah is a documentary film director and longtime producer. She is the founder of and president of Intention Media Incorporated since serving as Hillary Clinton's personal videographer for a 2008 campaign. Um, Hannah has worked as a producer and advisor to women's candidates and elected officials. Uh, Wendy Sash is a documentary film director, Emmy Award winning network t news television producer and writer, an author and advocate for women's issues. She's also the former Capitol Hill press secretary, media relations executive, and author of two critically acclaimed books on women and careers, which I encourage you all to check out. Um, welcome to the conversation, Thank uh, Hannah and Wendy. Awesome. Well, I want to ask you both, I want to ask you where and when did you have the idea uh, that not only did you want to make this film, but who you wanted to follow? Um, I'm really interested in place. I, you know, sometimes like there's, you're, you're in a, you might be, as um, Lauren has said, you might have been in a meeting or you may have um, been sitting in front of the television on a Sunday and, and deciding right now, this is, this is what I have to do. So where and when did you decide that you wanted to make search and, and, and how did you decide who you wanted to follow? Well, I can start with the first part of that question. I'll let Hannah take the, take the second half of that. It started after the devastating results of the 2016 presidential election, right? Um, we got a president who many of us did not expect that was going to happen. And then we saw the power of the first Women's March in 2017. And after that, and I was there and Hannah was there also marching in Washington, after that, all of these stories started bubbling up about how many women had decided that they were going to run for office. Women who had maybe never thought that they would run for office before, or maybe that they weren't ready to run right then at that moment. And they were throwing their hats into the ring and they were saying, I need to do more than march. I need to do more than write postcards to my members of Congress. I need to do more than just, you know, get on Facebook and spew, you know, all of what's happening. I need to run for office. I need to do something. I need to stand up. And we were so taken by this incredible surge of women who are coming and saying that they needed to run for office that it just felt like something was happening. Something, there was a movement underway. And as storytellers, this was an incredible story. We wanted to capture these stories. Something transformative was happening that was going to shift the paradigm of women running for office in this country. Yes, in terms of place, I think we 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 all we had an, a third person that was with us, and she's a, she's now our executive producer, Tanya Selvaratnam, um, and she we had both talked to her about this idea that we had about following the surge of women running. I um, mean, she said, "Let's all meet." So we or first we had a call and we discussed it on a call, and then and then we met in person, and uh, it just seemed like there was nothing was going to stop us. We were going to do it. So we started out, we actually spoke with um, and ended up filming with uh, close to eight to 10 candidates um, and women early in, in, two in 2017, trying to figure out, you know, who would be um, good to follow for through the primary and then also through the general. So we were looking for strong candidates in their, in their primary. It was also very important to us that our three were diverse. We had early on, we, we knew we would probably follow three women. Um, so we have, you know, Jana is in her 50s and she's not unmarried and doesn't have a child. And uh, Liz has two small, was running with two small children. And Lauren was 31 at the time when, when we first met her. Um, and so there were all these different, and, and we wanted, you know, women from different backgrounds. And we also wanted to stay away from the coasts. It was really important for us to, to be in states that we knew there was so much going on, but those stories don't get told. 
a lot of times, right? We don't, in, in, the, in this long form way, we might see snippets on the news, but, but we wanted to really travel to these places and, and, and show that the surge was happening in every corner of the country. And then we decided to focus on women trying to flip seats red to blue. So. You know, in fact, we started out, we thought it might be a bipartisan film, that we weren't just looking to film Democratic women running for office. And in fact, our very first shoot was at the Women's Campaign School at Yale, which is a bipartisan, and Lauren knows that she's a, she's a proud graduate of that program. And we went there intentionally because we spoke to the director, Patty Russo, and you know, we knew that she doesn't just support Democratic women, but she's training all women running for office. And we thought this will be a great place to cast our characters. And we tried and we continued looking for other Republican women and we were vetting women. I mean, it is a film, so you're doing casting. You're looking for people who are going to pop on screen and share their stories and give you some access. And, and we're also looking for some viability, people who will make it through a primary. You don't really know what's gonna happen. You're sort of, you know, betting on your horse. Um, and ultimately, you know, the surge was on the Democratic side. It was really, it was a blue wave. And so that's the story of 2018. And that's ultimately really what, what shook out for, for all of our characters who we followed. And we're seeing that, right? We are seeing uh, not only, I think, an unprecedented, I would say, uh, trajectory in terms of mounting power, um, held by young people, held by women and people of color, I hope mounting. Um, but I think we're also seeing some change. We're seeing a different, uh, a different style. And that's something that I wanted to talk about because it is not so much for me, and I, I say this all the time when we talk a lot about representation, you know, making sure that um, fields are inclusive, um, that government is inclusive. It's not so important to me that we just have the representation. What I'm looking for is a difference. Like how do people use power differently? How do people share power and not hoard power? How do we think about issues? How do we think differently about issues? And that's something that you begin to see um, in, 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 in Surge. And as we were saying earlier, Ross shared, you know, it, 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 it'll make you cry. It'll move you uh, to, to feeling like you, there is something that we can do. There is something afoot um, in this country. And if we harness it, we can create real palpable, tangible change and real inclusion. I want to talk about that for a moment because anyone listening can get inspired uh, hearing from Lauren. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling really uh, moved in ways that I hadn't even anticipated. What was it in particular about Lauren um, that made you think maybe early on, this is, this is, she's one to watch? Um, well, it's so obvious. I mean, you, when, you, when you hear Lauren in the first, you know, 30 seconds, I mean, I, was, I didn't even know the story, by the way, about Carol Mosley Braun and, and Oprah. I loved you sharing that story. And it's so true. Um, and I, I was actually working on the Hill when Carol Mosley Braun was in the Senate. So uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how old I am. I'm so much older than you. And I went to school at Northwestern. So the whole Illinois connection is, and, uh, is all very palpable to me too. Um, I mean, Lauren's just She's tremendous. It was very early on. Um, we were told about Lauren from a bunch of different people. We were saying this is a race to watch. She wasn't targeted yet on the D triple C list. She was still, you know, running a really scrappy campaign. As she says in the film, the campaign was in her backpack. Um, she was, you know, pretty much flying solo with her campaign manager. Um, but there was something about Lauren and people realized it. And uh, I started reaching out to um, her campaign to see if we could book her, if, you know, she'd be willing to let us follow her around. And, you know, that's, a, it's a, you know, Lauren, we can ask this all of the time is, how did you build that trust? And, and did the candidates give you access? And we always say, you know what, it took some time. Like, you know, people are nervous. You know, you're a first time candidate, your campaign manager, you know, this is their first campaign, the comms, you know, your communications director, the same thing. They don't want you to be caught with your pants down. You know, it's, it's a very, um, it can be, I'm sure it's a very intimidating and, uh, you know, nerve wracking situation to get into to say, sure, documentary film crew, come follow me around. Um, so all of that was, 
was sort of, it took some time for us to build a little bit of trust and to make sure that we would be given some access. And I think that happens also over time. Lauren came to New York a bunch of times for campaign events. And Hannah and I made sure that we would see her because we weren't always in Illinois. But I think all of that FaceTime helps make a difference. But there's there's a line that Lauren says in the film that when you were talking about, you know, what what leadership looks like and diversity of leadership and why it's so important to have different representation. Lauren, you say, you know, our country, and I'm going to paraphrase this, but our country will be so much better. Our government will be so much better when there are teachers and doctors and nurses in Congress. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is one of the most powerful lines of the film. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most powerful messages of the film. And it's what we were trying to reflect, right? That we were looking to follow real people, people who are relatable, people who don't fit the traditional model of what an elected official looks like. To us, that was so incredibly pivotal, you know, it's pivotal in the film so we could see different representation. And yes, I do believe our government is stronger when we have real people. And you were pointing it out earlier when you were talking about the, um, the um, group on the Hill of, that's focused on maternal health and what you've created and that you were able to bring that to the attention of, you know, the House of Representatives because you're a nurse and because you're, you know, a black woman and because you're a millennial woman. So these issues are very relevant to you. And then quickly you were able to get, you know, a group together to support your initiative. That to me is what representation is about. And that's why we need people of different backgrounds and different experiences who are relatable, who are real people. Um, and I don't, all of that just speaks to me. And I know I'm taking up way too much airtime here, but I was so taken by all of the things you were saying earlier because it's so true. And, and you're walking the walk. I mean, that to me is what's so exceptional about Lauren is, you know, I, it's one thing to be sort of stumping about healthcare, but it's another thing to get into Congress and on day one move and, and to, you know, get legislation passed. I mean, that just doesn't happen with a freshman member. It just doesn't happen. So this is, th I think this is, Hannah, I want to um, turn it to you, and I know you may have some some thoughts, some other thoughts, and I want you to make sure that you uh, get them in here, but I, I think the one of the things that I'm wondering is, is did you see a pattern? Um, do you think that the candidates that you were following, um, and of course, Lauren, um, are suggestive of, of what's to come? Or do we sort of have these cycles, you know, these, these, you know, these trends, these, these shifts, and, and they're short-lived? But I'm, I'm sort of asking you to forecast, if you could, based on, based on being up close and personal, based on going, you know, following behind Lauren when she's knocking on doors all in Naperville and other places, um, Tell us a little bit about what you think this portends for the future, the future of politics, and especially what it will look like when we have mostly millennials in, in, uh, in government. Ooh. <laughs> We're like, oh God, oh no, don't, don't give the millennials power. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming to you, Lauren. So I want you. I'm going to ask you that question. So you, 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 you see what I'm teeing up here. All right. That's amazing. Um, I can't wait for that. I what I what I always say and what we say is that there's absolutely no turning back. We are. This is this is the, the we're we're seeing the change and we're going forward. We are getting more women, more women of color in office. I think every cycle. Uh, I think we're going to see that this cycle in a big way, um, and I think we'll continue to see it until we get representation. Um, true, true represent, uh, true representative democracy. Um, so, because we had, because one of our questions in the film and 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 a, a key theme is whether this is 2018 was just a moment or will it be a movement, right? And so we really believe that it is, it's a movement. Of course, we still have to do all the work, right? We we still have to support women candidates and support get out, getting out the vote and make it you know, make it easier for women of all different backgrounds to run. Um, I think women also with young kids, it's super hard if, you know, we, we see that with Liz, she, you know, she's a fantastic candidate um, and then she loses and she says, okay, I'm not going to be running again probably for 10 years um, until my kids are bigger because uh, it was just, it's just 
was too intense. Um, she also had a really difficult district. Um, but can I, I just want to go back really quickly to, to share, I think your, your question about, and Wendy answered it completely, but your question about why we chose Lauren, and it also touches on why we chose the other candidates too. We, it was, it was, Lauren's story was so amazing. The fact that she had this personal connection to such an important issue, like having a, a pre-existing condition, um, and then being able to share and articulate that story and how that, the, and how that connected to uh, hearing her representative make a promise and then, you know, renege on that promise. Right, and so, the, so for, for I think in, in film and in storytelling, it's so amazing to have someone who can articulate their, can, that, that's both you know, personally affected, but then also has this passion, I think professionally and in their person. So I just wanted to share that as well. Yes, absolutely. I know that we're winding down because um, this conversation is amazing yet is just the prelude to something that I think is so incredible. And I know that people are, are now getting really excited about seeing the film. So Lauren, I wanna ask you, I'm gonna turn the tables a little bit. I wanna ask you this question. Um, I know that especially today, when we think about um, millennial generation, we think about the influence of media. And certainly I'm Generation X, you know, of course, but I would say that media today is much more interactive and much more influential than when I was younger. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you is you had these amazing filmmakers and Wendy and Hannah following you around and capturing these, uh, you know, all of these moments, intimate moments, moments of uncertainty, um, moments of excitement. What was the, what was that like? Not only were you um, hitting the campaign trail, but you, it was being, it, there was, you had a, you were making a documentary at the same time. So as uh, we close and I get ready to ask Ross to, to join us again, how do you think running and at the same time um, being filmed for a documentary may have changed or calcified or or shifted or amped you up um, in a way that um, maybe you didn't even anticipate. Okay, so this is what I have to tell you. So Wendy was being really generous, okay? I was like very skeptical about this project <laughs> because, you know, we had had a lot of people come early on in the election. I mean, several television shows, other documentaries that fizzle, books, right? Like all these things. And they all wanted our time. And Wendy and Hannah came at a time where like, I was like, I just tried to win this election. Okay. So if you're going to come, you need to come on. <laughs> and then we got to know each other. And it's like fabulous, right? But what I didn't appreciate was that the community was so excited. And they felt like if there was a film that wanted to tell the story of the 14th and something really was going on here. And it validated for all the volunteers and all the activists and all the people who were doing the work behind the scenes, you know, who were just giving so much of their own time without a title, right, without recognition, but just because they have lived here their whole lives and raised their families here and they were fed up, right? It was validating for them that people would care enough about our community and what we were building to want to tell the story. And so they were excited. So then when I saw that and that it wasn't going to be this liability or something that, you know, we needed to be um, careful about or whatever, um, then I was like, okay, well, y'all can see everything. And, you know, it, it was, it was, I'm grateful to be able to see it back because now like, well, there's so much that I just don't remember and didn't remember until I watched the film. Um, and then, and what we did was remarkable. It didn't, it, I knew it was hard while we were doing it, obviously, uh, but I didn't quite appreciate everything that was happening in the moment. And so I'm grateful that they saw what I couldn't see and, um, and were willing to tell the story. Oh, and on that note, I want to say that I'm grateful. I'm grateful, Lauren, for the example that you that you set of what can happen when a real person who cares about real issues um, ends up where you are. May you have an illust an illustrious career. Thank and you. I want to thank you, Wendy and and Hannah, for having the foresight 
to capture it. And um, we're getting ready to, to watch. And I just want to invite everyone um, to make sure that you follow Lauren Underwood, that you follow Serge, that you tell others about it. And I'm going to ask Ross to come on in so we can get set up, get your popcorn, and get ready. <laughs> um, a special thank you to Congresswoman Underwood for joining us. Um, Hannah and Wendy, thank you for being here. And of course, Tracy Hall, thank you for moderating a wonderful, inspirational conversation. Um, and thank you to our museum partners and library partners all across um, Illinois for joining us tonight. Um, I, I do hope you have your popcorn and your ballots ready. The election is only exactly a month ago, a month from today. And so uh, make sure you're registered to vote where you are. Make sure you're getting your ballots where they need to go. Um, if you registered for us with us on Eventbrite, you can check your inbox uh, in about a minute and you'll have a link to watch the film. Um, if you joined us on Facebook Live, if you're on Facebook Live right now, look in the comment section for the link that will invite, that will allow you to register for Eventbrite to then receive um, the link to the film. Um, and uh, you can also always watch the film uh, streaming anytime on BET or Showtime. Um, you can also visit and learn more about Surge on their website at surgethemovie.com. Um, thank you all again for joining us and thank you also to our library partners um, for being with us and our museum partners as well. Um, and enjoy the film. If you have any trouble um, uh, connecting, please uh, email us and let us know um, so we can reach everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight and thanks to our wonderful panelists and hosts as well. <laughs>